Let's just say one more round of thank you to all those who helped BBS happen this week. I love it. I love it. The place had like a, a, like a sweaty overtone as you left every night, uh, but there was joy every night. So the joy and a little bit of sweat. And I was like, okay, that was, that was great. And Jesus showed up. There was the presence of God working. And I love it. I love that we get to see lives be changed and we get to be a part of that. Praise God. Amen. 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 Listen, uh, if uh, I haven't said it to you, happy 4th of July. Say that around you. You're like, it's not the 4th yet, but it is the weekend of the 4th, and so we get to celebrate that in this place, and uh, we're going to celebrate the freedom that Christ gives to us. We get to celebrate that together, and I want to just begin by praising God, uh, and let's just ask the Lord to move in this place as we open his word, as we seek him. So would you just uh, extend a hand and pray with me? Father God, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus, and we love that you came, Jesus, to set people free. We celebrate that on this 4th of July weekend. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as we listen and learn from your word today. Lord, we praise you for every one of these kids who came this week. We, we pray that you would have your hand a blessing on every one of their lives. Thank you for all the volunteers. I pray that you would honor them as they have honored you. And Lord, we look forward to all that you will do, not only in this coming week, but Lord, as you walk with us uh, in this world, we know that you love us and you're for us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, let's do this together. If you have a Bible today, would you take that out? And I'm hearing a little bit of ring in that. I don't know if you guys hear it as well. You can help me. If you need a Bible, would you raise your hand and we'll bring you one? And that would be great. We'd love to be able to put that in your hands. If you need one to keep, just keep it as our gift to you. And then we're going to be in the second half of your Bible today. There it is. I hear it. First uh, John chapter 2. That's where we're going to be all, all the way to the end of your uh, Bible. First John chapter 2. And we want to make sure that uh, you get to know that we're going to be dealing with three verses today. Three verses. You, you can handle that. It's all right. The title of the message is this, One Love. By the way, uh, Jocelyn already mentioned this to you, but if you're using the app, all the uh, notes will be there for you, and you can go to Sunday, and you can find it, notes, and uh, everything is going to be there for you. But I want to just talk about uh, our country for a moment and celebrate Independence Day. Uh, this holiday weekend, uh, it's going to be celebrated in many places across the fruited plain. You're going to hear this celebration going on. There will be firework displays in major cities like New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Dallas, Pasadena, Pullman, and Moxie. It's going to be there. You're like, where can I celebrate around here? Apparently, Moxie is kind of like, uh, you know, the Wild West. You just go out there and launch stuff. And uh, you're like, you know, don't burn down any hops fields. Just let it go. And so have some fun. Uh, I would tell you this. Many people tell you the 4th of July holiday is about liberty and it's about freedom. And it is. It's about uh, us being able to have rights. And we get to have that here in America. That's wonderful. But I also want to tell you that uh, the 4th of July is about love. And you're like, whoa, Jason, do not mess. The, the, the love thing that's already taken care of on Valentine's. Do not mess with our holidays. Well, hang on. I just want to give you a little history. I have a, a history minor. Uh, before God called me into ministry, I thought I was going to be a history teacher. I thought that's where God was leading me. And so I have a history minor, and I love history, and you can learn from history. If you don't learn from history, you're doomed to? Oh, you know that. Oh, let me repeat that. If you're No, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Here's a little history. In 1765, 1765, the Stamp Act was passed by the British Parliament in part to help pay for the debt, in part to help pay for the debt incurred by the uh, French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. And it was also there to pay for troops being kept in the colonies. And it was there to pay, and you know things about taxes, they always find something more. And so the Stamp Act was imposed, and that's the right word, it was imposed on the British colonies here in America. Here's the truth. And uh, you, said, you said it was about love, and you're talking about the Stamp Act. Uh, this is the truth. The colonists did not love, they did not love this tax imposed by the British Parliament, which had no representation from the colonies. So here's this, hey, hey we're going to pass this, and we're going to impose this on the people, and the people don't even have a voice. Do you think that would upset, would that upset anybody in here? <laughs> Okay. All right. You're like, where are we going today? 
See, what happened is it stirred the masses. It stirred the masses who did not love taxation without representation, but they did love where they lived. They loved the, the new land. They loved the, the Americas. They loved it. They did not love the empire reaching out. And so it was a stirring question to the population. Really, the Stamp Act really put things to the forefront. Do you love the British Empire or do you love being a part of this new land? And as people began to answer that question of what do I love, it moved people along. And you're saying, Jason, you are way oversimplifying this. And I am on purpose because we would be here all day. But uh, it was oversimplified. But here's what I want you to think about. When we talk about love, love has such a powerful, it is, it is a force. It moves people. And it would lead in those days to decisions being made in the next years that people would express their love. They would express their love for freedom. They would express their love for liberty in tangible ways. Colonists would organize themselves. They would work together. They would sign their names to documents such as the Declaration of Independence, really putting their lives on the line and saying, we love this enough to say we're going to go for it. We're going to go for it. We're going to fight for it. We're going to establish something new here. They would form militias. They would prepare to fight for what they love. And that really brings us into what we're going to look at today about what do you love? What do you love? And it's going to come into this, uh, our study in 1 John. This is a letter. 1 John is one of three letters written by the disciple John. John wrote the gospel, good news according to John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then John also wrote the last book in your Bible, the book of Revelation. And as we look in 1 John today, you will see that uh, we have to hang on to this idea of a clash of kingdoms, a clash between two kingdoms. Uh, And you have to decide today, you have to decide who are you going to love? Who are you going to love? You can't love both kingdoms. It it is not allowed. It is not allowed by either kingdom. And so as we look at this, you're going to understand it. So if you have your Bible open, I'm just going to read these three verses. First John chapter two, verses 15 through 17. Listen to what it says about loving which kingdom today do not love here's what it says verse 15 do not love the world or things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him that's a big statement for all that is in the world the desires of the flesh the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the father but from the world And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, let's not go any further than to recognize what we hold is not just a historical document. It's not just a piece of history. But what we hold in our hands, what we're going to interact with today is the word of God for us. Amen? Amen Amen simply means I agree with that. So you're saying, what are we saying when you say that? That's a churchy statement. It simply means I agree with that. I agree with that. This is God's word. Let's understand God's word. And those three verses today, you say, well, three verses, is that all you got for us, Jason? Is that you don't think we can handle it anymore? Actually, there's probably more in these three verses than we can handle in weeks of study. If we really dive into it, if we really get into the gold mine, there's more gold than you can possibly lug out this morning. And as we dive into this truthfully, uh, we want to make sure that we get things right when we understand God's word. And so we are pursuing clarity and cleaning up confusion. And there may have been, as I was reading this, there could be easily confusion because it says, do not love the world. And you're saying, wait a second. I've seen at football games this crazy guy with a sign that says John 3, 16. And I know it says this. In fact, we'll put it on the screen for you. So in fact, would you just read this out loud with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See the confusion that could happen for people there? God loves the world and yet John is saying don't love the world. Which is it? Which is it? And you're like, see, it's confusing. It's contradicting. Actually, actually, that's where we have to say, let's 
Let's learn. Let's grow together today. Let's understand it. And many people have been confused by this. And so we say, let's clear it up. Let's, let's get it clear. Let's clarify some terms here. When we talk about the world, there is a word that is a Greek word because your New Testament was written in Greek. And that word is cosmos. Cosmos. Maybe you would uh, understand it if we put a C in there and we called it cosmos. And we're going to talk about the world, the world, cosmos. But there are two understandings, and you can only understand what, how the word is being used is exactly the same word, but it's context, 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 tells you everything about that word. So same word, two usages, and I want to give you the, the first usage, which was used in John three sixteen for God so loved the cosmos, God so loved the world. Let me give you the first usage here. It means the world means the material universe, the material universe. That means people and creation, nature, etc. Everything you experience right now that you're able to take in in the world, this is, it was created by God. You can read about that in Genesis. Genesis, I come back here often. You should come back there often because it lays the foundation for what God was doing. The creator God in Genesis 1 and 2, in these chapters, we discover that God was intentionally creating all that we know and experience in the material world. Sounds like Madonna to me, the material world. Some of you are like, I don't even know who Madonna is. Let it go. Uh, At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the creator declared of his creation every day, six days of creation he created. At the end of every day, he said this statement about his creation. Oh, that's good. That's good right there. It is good. It was a seal of approval that the material world, what he was creating, wasn't bad. It was good. When he created the man and the woman on day six of his creation, he said these words, very good. Yes, very good. That is what he said about his creation. This is important because in many religions, uh, they only speak of the spiritual world, what you can't see, what you can't quantify. They only speak of that as good. In those belief systems, you're released from the constraints when you die and you join the good in those religions, the good, and you join nirvana or you join the force or you join oblivion, and that's the good that's really out here. That means everything that is material is bad. Do you realize how different the Bible and Christianity, what it believes is so different than what other religions are teaching. And it's saying, no, this is good. God created it to be good. It created it to be this way. As we understand this about the creator, he's saying, listen, I'm not done yet. The Bible tells us that when Jesus rose from the dead, he physically, bodily came back to life with a new, not improved, a new body. A new body. And it says that he is going to, in the future, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And that is going to be material, not spiritual. It's going to be real. It's going to, you're going to touch it in that way. And so we talk about the world, the cosmos. When we understand John 3, 16, for God loved his creation. He loved his people. He loved what he has created so much. He loved this material world so much that he gave his one and only son. And whoever, whoever, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter when you live, what matters is if you believe in him, you will have eternal life. Whew. That's how much God loves the cosmos, the world. But the second understanding is this, and you will, you'll see this as we get into it. The second understanding for the word cosmos world is this and that's what first john is going to tell us world it is the organized system headed by satan that leaves god out of everything and is a rival to him the organized system headed by satan that leaves god out and is a rival to him i was trying to like narrow it down so it would be like the material universe and then like a three-word definition but that just didn't work the second one takes some more understanding. The usage here when, God, when uh, 1 John is telling us, do not love the world, it takes a little more, more understanding that it's an organized system headed by Satan that leaves God out and is a rival to him. Now, when I say rival to him, we don't see Satan and Jesus on equal planes. Like, oh, they're really duking it out. and Who's going to win? No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Jesus, son of God, Satan, angel, 
And Jesus has already won the day. And we are just waiting for the ultimate delivery of the victory that everyone will get to see and know. And some will rejoice and some will weep as we talk about this. So think about this. The world, again, the world, a system of values and goals from which God is excluded. I got that from uh, pastor and teacher Charles Ryrie. I like that. A system of values and goals from which God is excluded. We don't want God in anything. We don't want him in anything. I don't want him to speak into my relationships. I don't want him to speak into my finances. I don't want him to speak into my education. I don't want him to speak into anything. I don't want God in there. Understanding that God loves the material universe then, his own creation, when you understand that, it is powerful. And when you understand that we are not to be engaged and hold hands with and love a system that is headed by Satan, that's powerful. When you understand those things, it's important. The kind of love that would lead God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to put in motion a plan to rescue people from tyranny to sin That is a love that is to be celebrated on the 4th of July and the 5th and the 6th and all the way around that we celebrate in this place. We love it. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. We're going to sing about that. We're going to tell kids about that at Vacation Bible School. Youth group going down to Chile to celebrate what God has done for us. We're going to be a part of that. And we want that to happen right here, even, even in like crazy wild west lands like moxie we want that all right you're like i'm from moxie stop saying that let's give you a couple of warnings today out of the passage that will help you know how to conduct yourself in this world today not someday in the future today let me give you just uh the first of three warnings here warning number one where he says do not and he's very clear here do not love the world that organized system headed by Satan, which is opposed to God and is a rival to him, wants to exclude him from everything. That is what he's saying. Warning, do not love the world. But here's where people read this and they say, that's right. I don't love any of the people in this world. (laughs) No, I don't love any of them. And and I don't love any, you know, just leave me alone. That's not understanding it correctly. In fact, Here's where some, some have got it wrong, asceticism, and I'm going to use that word because I don't use that word very often, but it's the right word. Asceticism is not the answer. You say, give me more. If it's not the answer, maybe define what that is. Asceticism is this, severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Asceticism. Hey, uh, do you want to come over? Nope. Hey, do you want to go to the movie? Nope. Do you want to? Do you want to come to church? Nope. I just I, I reject everything. Pretty much, you become an island of isolation, and that some people say that's what God wants. And I'm like, you probably ought to look at how Jesus conducted himself. It was not with asceticism, rejecting everything, and uh, you know, not being a part of this world. Because if we reject everything, it includes all that God made that is good in this world. See, we are supposed to love people. We are supposed to love people. We are supposed to love God's creation. We're supposed to love and celebrate all the things that God uh, gave to us, like skill and talent and art and music and sport and you name it. There's so many good things that reflect a creative God, a creator God, a God who loves us, a God who gives us so many things. You... You say, well, that's hard. That's hard because where do you draw the line? And that's really true. Instead of drawing lines, how about just walking with Jesus? Instead of saying, I'm going to make hard and fast rules, why don't you just walk with Jesus and ask him again and again, Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, what do you think about this? In Jesus' day, when he was ministering, the Pharisees, which were known as the separated ones, they were the good guys. The good guys, the most religious, the most spiritual, they were excellent at setting all kinds of rules. They would tell you, and with pride, they would tell you, maybe like Napoleon or one of those uh, where they put, put this with the hand in the shirt kind of thing. But they would say to you, I reject that. I'm not a part of that. I don't belong to that. I don't do that. In the midst of trying not to love the world, they rejected the people made in the image of God. 
They rejected, ultimately, the Savior who came for them. Because in uh, asceticism, rejecting, not wanting to love the world in any way, they truly did not love all that God had. You, you might say this. Listen, Jason, listen. Uh, I don't love the world, but I'm friends with the world. I don't love the world. That, that, that's too tight for me. But I, I'm, I'm friends with the world. Let me just give you one place in Scripture where it says this. James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, You adulterous people. That gets your attention. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world... And that means the organized system headed by Satan that is opposed to God and is a rival to him, excluding him from everything. You adulterous people do not know that friendship with the world is enmity that makes you an enemy in opposition with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm not in love with the world. I'm just friends. Now, many people have tried to escape this world, escape it so that they wouldn't have to have that hand-in-hand -hand relationship with God because it's too hard when you have to keep coming to him and saying, what do you think about this, Lord, and how, how should I handle this situation, and what, what, do you, what would you do here, Lord? And I'm going to give you just a couple examples. We, uh, we witnessed this in history. We witnessed the monks, uh, monks of all kinds of varieties who withdraw from society and live isolated, some of them not even speaking to one another, and you're like, that would be a joy. <laughs> that would just be a, like a peaceful week. Now they're doing this day in and day out. And trying to get away from the world and misunderstanding that you are to be in the world, but not a part of it, not a friend with it, but you, you're meant to be here. God placed you here. So you have the monks of all kinds of varieties. You have uh, in our modern days, and when I say modern days, in the last uh, couple hundred years, the Amish people who in an attempt to be free of the love of the world, they said, they said oh, 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 we're going to stop. This is no longer uh, future things we don't embrace. We don't embrace buttons. We only do hooks. We, we don't embrace electricity. We only do this. I was thinking about this uh, because some uh, very strict Amish folks didn't let their kids learn English until they were 14. All born and raised here in the United States. All born and raised here. And wouldn't let their kids learn English till they were 14. And they came and they bought my grandfather's farm. And they would come every uh, so often and it, more with frequency as my grandfather got older. And they would come with a suitcase full of cash. Like it looked like something out of a mafia, like 12 Amish men. <laughs> and a suitcase full of cash. And they're like, are you ready to sell? And my grandpa's like, I'm not ready yet. Come back. And they would come back with more money and more money, and more money, all in cash right there in that suitcase. They don't believe in banks. They don't believe in some of these institutions. Don't believe in, in some of these things. And so, uh, but they would, they would do this. It would make me laugh that uh, they say, we, we don't, you know, technology is wrong. Uh, we won't use phones unless it's at our neighbor's house. So they would pay their neighbors to have a phone installed at their house that they could come and use. So technically, isn't that your phone just on their property? <laughs> yeah, but it, that's worldly. Ah, see, we're missing it. Monks, we're missing it. And so many of us sometimes when we're saying, I want to do what God wants, sometimes we make rules that don't look like Jesus at all. They don't look like him. You see, the Pharisees did this all the time. They would construct a rule, and the second thing they would do, they would construct a loophole that they could get through it. You're like, that sounds like our government. <laughs> Again, we're just trying to protect the live stream right now. Let's just let that happen. Yeah. Listen, the first thing that, as we talk about this, asceticism is not the answer, but here is something that you should know. Recognizing the worldly system is critical. You say, well, there is no worldly system. There is and it wants to exclude God and wants you to join in to its system. So let me give you a second warning today. Christians, people who want to follow Jesus, warning that we have powerful enemies in this world. We have powerful enemies in this world, and it's not from some distant country across the land, across the sea, across the globe. These enemies are right here. These enemies are right here. And you're like, you, Jason? No, not me. The, this, is, this is in all of us. And he gives us this in verse 16. Let me just read it again for us so we can see these three enemies. 
For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, capital F on that, Father from heaven, but is from the world. These desire, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride of life, those are three very powerful enemies and we all have them. And it's not from out here, it's from right here. It originates here. When I talk to people and they say, Jason, why didn't God just destroy all the evil in the world? Why did he go to the cross and do all that? Why didn't he just destroy the evil in the world? Because he would have to destroy us. And don't miss what John 3, 16 says. He loves us. He loves us with a love that's sometimes hard to understand. Say, I wouldn't love me. But God does. But he knows that we have this battle, this, this enemy, and it's right here, the desires of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. Different translations translated this world into cravings and lust. Cravings and lust. Your translation of the Bible may say that, but I'm going to tell you it's the same word, epithumia. I usually don't use a lot of Greek uh, on a Sunday morning. like, what is going on here? But uh, it's important when you understand that these are not different words. It's the same word. But sometimes they apply it differently, but it just simply, uh, we got to get to, what does that word mean? To desire greatly, a strong desire, a longing, a lust. And I'm going to give you maybe a great way, and if you're a note taker, write this down. I like how Pastor Tim Keller defined this word because it's a simple definition. It is an over-desire. It is an over-desire for something. An over-desire. To over-desire something is to look at something good and to look at that good thing and to make it an ultimate thing. To boost it into a place it shouldn't be. And we do that all the time. We over-desire something and it leads us all over the place. It leads us to love the world. We can over-desire food. We can over-desire drink. We can over-desire sex. We can over-desire our appearance. We can over-desire money. None of those are wrong in themselves. None of them. But to over-desire something causes us to go after it, and we will sin to get it. An over-desire for something. You say, well, explain that. Well, here we go. Food. An over-desire for food will cause you to overeat. An over-desire for food will cause you to undereat. And to elevate to food to a place it doesn't belong. It doesn't belong. It receives worship. Uh, to over-desire drink. The Bible does not forbid alcohol, but it does forbid drunkenness. And most people do not know how to handle alcohol only to get drunk. They don't know that you, they just don't know that you can have alcohol without getting drunk. And you say, well, I can't. Then you got to stay away from that. And most of our world does not, does not know how to not over-desire it. Sex. Sex is a gift from God, but people serve it as if it were God. As if it were God. And over-desire for sex leads people to use and abuse others for their own desires. It is an over-desire. God created it good. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 2. He created it good. It's a gift. This is good. And over-desire says, I'm going to use it for my purposes. Over-desire. Appearance. Appearance and over desire means I value or devalue others based on skin color, based on their hairstyle. Boy, that has changed all over the place. Like, can you believe their wig? Oh my goodness. So ostentatious, you know? And you say, what's ostentatious? I don't know, but it means that wig right there, that wig. Mm, I don't know. Uh, tattoos, age, clothing, hairstyle, piercing. People make all kinds of value decisions based on what we say is good. An over-desire for you to conform to what I say is good is an over-desire for appearance. As we look at this, the over-desire of the flesh, the over-desire of the eyes, and then this pride of life. Uh, I'm just going to stop right here. And I'm going to just ask you, you don't have to tell your neighbor this, but right now you'd just say, is there, is there an area, are there some areas in my life right now where I have over-desire for something, a craving, a lust, envy, for something that is good, but I am elevating it right now into a place 
of ultimate? Is there something right now that you have elevated to a place where God said, that, that's good, but you've taken what's good and you've made it ultimate? Jesus understood this battle, by the way. I love in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, where it says this, he was tempted, Jesus, in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. You say, how was Jesus tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin? Jesus was tempted with the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. He was tempted by the devil specifically, and these are the enemies you're tempted with. Jesus understood this. In Matthew chapter 4, the devil tried to get Jesus to obey him and have him submit to the system of the world headed by Satan, opposed to God. You say, well, that's a foolish thing that Satan did. The battle would have been won if Jesus would have submitted to any of these. Think about this. You can read about it in Matthew 4. Knowing that Jesus was hungry after fasting for 40 days, Satan immediately went for his flesh. He appealed to the desire of the flesh. He said to Jesus, turn these stones into bread. I know you're hungry and you have the power to do it. Just obey the system of the world. Obey me. And you can satisfy that desire, that over-desire right now. Jesus confronts him with the scripture. Knowing Jesus was the Christ, he moved him to the next temptation and appealed to the pride of life. By the way, this is out of order with James. You're like, well, Satan did it out of order. <laughs> Surprise. Here we go. The pride of life. And throw, he said... Jesus, he took him to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem, and he said, throw yourself down because, and then Satan quoting the scripture said, he will command his angels concerning him that he will not strike his foot against the stone. And so Satan is quoting the scripture. Satan knows scripture. He's not dumb. And he's tempting him with the pride of life. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it that you are the Christ. Let's, let's have you prove it. Show off. Show us. Jesus rebuffs him with the scripture again. He's not done yet. Knowing that Jesus is the king of heaven, he took him to the highest point in the world and supernaturally shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, listen, this can all be yours. It's the desire through the eyes. This can all be yours. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Bow down and worship me. Sounds like the University of Washington. Okay, <laughs> that did not fly. <laughs> so Jesus said, no, 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 no. And he rebuffs him again with the scripture. I want you to pay attention to this. Jesus did not talk or reason with the evil one. He did not talk with or reason with the evil one. He rebuffs him with the scripture. First of all, he recognized that this is a trap, one of the enemies of the system of the devil. He recognized it. He remembered the words of the scripture from Deuteronomy. He quotes it and he rejects the lies and he rejects Satan in that way. And he's saying, this is how you can do it. And I can help you. I can help you live in this world. I can help you do it. Some of you are still mad about that University of Washington thing. <laughs> warning number three today, warning number three. And it's a beautiful warning, actually. The current system, the system of this world is doomed. Verse 17, here's what it says. And the world is passing away along with its desires, its over-desires, its, lu its lust, its cravings. It's about to pass away. But whoever does the will of God, and if you're somebody who underlines in their Bible, I encourage you to do that. The will of God. I would underline that in your Bible. The will of God. The will of God. What a great insight. As we look at this, verse 17 is telling us, do not play the short game. Do not take the shortcuts that the world is offering you. Come on and fulfill your over-desire. Come on, you can have that today. Come on, you don't have to wait for that. Come on. You deserve this. Don't take the shortcuts the world says will bring you happiness and fulfillment. The world system is coming to an end. That should get an amen. Amen? amen. 
the world system is coming to an end. Do not love the world which is doomed. Do not love the world is doomed. Instead, embrace the Savior. Embrace his perspective on all the issues that the world's saying, we got it, you got to get on board with us. Embrace God's perspective. Embrace his strength to help you make decisions every single day about how to live for him and not love the world. Embrace his peace because that you can get worn out. And God's saying, I'll help you. I'll help you. And then embrace this. Embrace that this life is not all there is. The world is passing away. The temptation, the over-desires of the world will not last forever. And the person who loves God does the will of God will last forever. I'm just going to give you a little homework. You say, it's a holiday weekend, Jason. You don't have to do it today, but I'm going to tell you, if you do a little homework in your Bible about that little phrase, the will of God. So many people say, what does God want for me? What does God want for me? What does God want for me? There are several places where it just, it's stated so plainly. I'm going to give you two today. First Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God. This is what God wants for you. Your sanctification, that he would change you and change you and change you to be more like him, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Reject what the world says about sex. That you can only know sex with shame. That you can only have it this way or you can have it any way you want. And when you embrace God's plan, the will of God for you is not asceticism. Sex is bad. That's what asceticism would say. The Bible says that's good and it's a gift. Understand it the way God created it. The will of God for you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. For this is the will of God. I wonder what you want for me, God. I wonder what you want for me. This is the will of God for you. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. That's a great verse for this holiday weekend. This country was intended to be a place where we could be free. But do you know that the government can't give you freedom like you want? It can't. Only the living God can give you freedom like you need. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants for God. Do you know what the will of God for you is? That you would live free. Free from the world system, not by hiding out in a monastery, not by retreating to the woods where you don't have to deal with other people because the enemies are still there. I'm going to tell you, there's so much here that we could uh, say, man, Lord, help me. There it is. There it is. Lord, help me in this world that you created to not be snatched up and in love with this world which is opposed to you. Live in the world. Live in the world. God needs you here to make a difference. The difference is don't fall in love with the system around you. Don't fall in love. Or I'm just, I'm just friends. Don't just be friends with the system around you which excludes God. I want to pray for us this morning that we would receive the help of the Lord and then uh, we're just going to sing and celebrate what a great way to enter the rest of this weekend. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we come to you. We know that you want to help us. Lord, this is hard work to live in this world that you created and yet have enemies over desire from our own flesh. The over desire that, that we're fed all the time through our eyes and then just our own pride. Father, this is hard work. We need your help. And so Holy Spirit, we ask for your help today. Lord, I pray for anybody who has not put their faith in the forgiveness that Jesus offers us today. 
I pray that today would be the day that freedom would come to multiple lives who have not known the freedom that only Jesus can give. Lord, we admit it. We need you. We need you. I pray that we would live out your will for us, that we would live as free people. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to sing and uh, celebrate this fact. Would you just stand where you're at? Let let's let the praises ring. Would you do that? Let, let, we've already sang that. You're like, we're singing that song again? No, we're going to sing some more. To the only one who can help us. Let's celebrate.